breakthrough in an end time prophetic move. Now, I don't know where you stand on end time prophecy, but you know Jesus is coming back. Amen? Do you know why he's coming back and when he's coming back? Well, when you read your Bibles and you see in Matthew 23, 37 through 39, he says, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who stoned the prophets and rejected the one sent to you. Like a mother hen longs to gather her chicks, how I long to gather you back to me, but you were not willing. O Jerusalem, you will not see me again until you cry out, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So the Jewish people have to come to faith. Something has to happen to bring the Word of God to our Jewish people that they might usher in the return of Messiah. And this is a part of this work. You see, you're making a difference tonight. When you read in your Bibles that Jew and Gentile become one in Messiah, that's exactly what's happening tonight because we are all one in Messiah, man. I've got to tell you the truth because it says the Word of God, the truth will set you free. Amen? How many of you know that your victory is because of the shed blood of Messiah? How many of you know that you bear the mark of the Messiah and the enemy looks at you and he cannot have you? You are redeemed, you are sealed by the blood of the Lamb. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world. It was not access to the kingdom of heaven for the Jew. It was not access for the kingdom of heaven. For the Gentile, it was access for the kingdom of heaven for all to receive the Lamb of God. kind of uh, take you on a little journey. I want you to, in your minds, go back 2,000 years. I want you to forget about the New Testament, because the New Testament didn't exist at the time of Jesus. The New Testament wasn't there. The New Testament was unfolding as people were capturing the various words that Jesus was speaking. And the system that was in place was the law of Moses, and the entire nation of Israel lived under the law of Moses. That was the rule and guide for all behavior, for all activity. For everything that occurred in the land of Israel had to do with God's calendar, with God's events, with God's instructions. And so the system was set in place. At the time that God gave the commands to Moses, there were 613 of them. 365 of them were yes, 248 were no. Well, those numbers may mean something to you. There's 365 days in a year that you might hear no every day of your life. And there's 248 bones in your body. So it's quite interesting. There's also 613 seeds in a pomegranate. So God is at work. He's mighty at work to give us the yeses and the noes. And the people of the time of Jesus were living in that system. There were Pharisees, there were Sadducees, teachers of the law. We know that Jesus studied with the teachers. He studied and debated with the Pharisees. And just because we don't know about the years from the time he was 12 to the time he was 30, we do know that he continued in his education, he continued in his Jewish life, and continued to make pilgrimages to Jerusalem because they were required. So he lived in a Jewish world, under a set of Jewish laws and Jewish regulations. In order for him to be the fulfillment of those laws and regulations, he had to observe all of it exactly as it was written. Overall, there were 365 prophecies fulfilled by Jesus that we can pinpoint directly pinpoint all the way beginning with the earliest prophecy about the enmity between the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent. Oldest prophecy in the Bible. And so when we look at this, we also realize that 28 specific prophecies were fulfilled on the last day. Now there's no coincidence in the timing of his entry into Jerusalem. It coincided with the instructions of Exodus chapter 12. It coincided with the day of the selection of the lambs. He made his triumphal entry. It's called, what's it called? Palm Sunday. So we know that the events that were taking place were very much specifically required in the Old Testament. 
Now, there were Jewish expectations. And people say, well, the Jews rejected Jesus. That's not entirely true. About one million Jewish people accepted Jesus when he walked this earth. If all the Jews had rejected Jesus, that would uh, mean that Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Peter, none of them believed in Jesus. They were all Jewish. So when we think about that statement that the Jews rejected Jesus, well, the entire New Testament is written by Jewish authors. They didn't reject Jesus. So that kind of negates the, the uh, fallacy of all the Jews rejected Jesus. Now, many did, and many did for various reasons. Okay? Uh, dog's not kosher. He didn't have any dog. Uh, but there were expectations, and we're going to talk about those expectations, because they were expecting a king. They were expecting a conquering hero. And if you remember, when he rode into Jerusalem, the people cried out, Hosanna, save us, O king, son of David. Because they had an expectation. They had an expectation because they were under Roman rule. And they believed that Jesus was coming, that a Messiah was coming. There was an expectation of what the Messiah would do. Now, when we walk into Walmart, we're not looking around to test Scripture against anybody's behavior. But 2,000 years ago, they were. As a matter of fact, the understanding of the prophecies, of the prophecies of Isaiah, the prophecies of Ezekiel, Micah, Daniel, Moses for that matter. As people were watching miracles unfold and hearing the teachings, they were asking themselves the questions, is this the one Isaiah was talking about? You see, we don't have the mind that they had. We don't think in biblical terms, but they were thinking in biblical terms. To think that Peter was an unschooled man doesn't mean that he was illiterate or uneducated in Jewish tradition. If you were a Jew, you understood Jewish tradition. And just because you, did, you didn't have the great temple in your city. So let's say you were in Tiberias, all right, which is outside. It's in the Galilee, and you're a Galilean. doesn't mean you don't have a synagogue there where you're bringing daily sacrifices, where you're taking care of the offerings that have to be made, but you're still required to make pilgrimage to Jerusalem three times a year. Now, we know for a fact that Jesus did that because, you remember, the event was Passover as the family was caravanning to, to uh, Jerusalem along the way. Uh, they left after the Passover celebration. Remember, Passover is a one-day event followed by a seven-day celebration called the Feast of Unleavened Bread. So most people talk about Passover being eight days, but that Passover is one day. The Feast of Unleavened Bread is seven days. So the Feast of Unleavened Bread is over. They pack up to leave. That's where tailgating came from. This is the original tailgating. They pack up to leave, and as was usual, people rolled with other people. There were large groups of people caravanning. And they get two days out of town, and they realize Jesus isn't with them. And what do they do? They go back and they find him. And where do they find him? They find him in the synagogue. And what's he doing? He said, what are you worried about me for? I'm about my father's business. He's there debating the law with those who believe in the law. Now, you all know the difference between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, right? Everybody does? Anybody not know that? Okay. All right, good. So, you know, the Pharisees believed in the Torah. They believed in the prophets, and they believed in resurrection. The Sadducees did not believe in the prophecies or in resurrection. And that's why they were sad, you see. Because <clears throat> they had no hope of resurrection. So we know that this was an annual event. There were three required pilgrimages <clears throat> that had to be made in accordance with the law. And God required that. It wasn't coincidental. It wasn't accidental. Uh, it was very significant. And we know that, you know, you take a look at Pentecost, for example. How could it be that Peter comes down from the upper room, preaches the gospel, and 3,000 people are saved? It wasn't just that there were 3,000 people there. 3,000 of the people that were gathered there were saved. Well, where do we have gatherings of three, five, seven, ten thousand people? We don't have those kind of gatherings. What about Jesus when he preached... Uh, in uh, right there on the Galilee, and all those people were gathered. How many were gathered? 5,000 on a hillside. 
Where do we have those kind of gatherings here that are just impromptu gatherings? Oh, a Bernie Sanders rally, a Donald Trump rally. Right? But we do that in a very organized fashion. These were gatherings that took place to hear teachings and to hear speaking. Because when we look at the timing of many of these events, you'll see it was Passover, it was Pentecost, it was the Feast of Tabernacles, because Jerusalem was swollen with people. The increase in the size of people who were observing these feast days was exponential. Anyone who lived outside the city, and remember, you have this uh, trade path that comes down from Iran all the way across Israel to Egypt. So you've got people traveling, you've got merchants coming, and you have people providing goods and services. And remember that there had to be corrals all over Israel to accommodate the amount of the lambs and the ox and the bulls and the uh, goats and, and all of those things for the various offerings. And, you know, commerce took place. And you also have to remember at this time of the Second Temple, 24,000 priests were active in taking care of the Temple. 24 divisions of 1,000 priests. Now, what's interesting to note is that when we look at this, we have to look at the who, the what, the where, the when, and the why. All of this is geared around the Hebrew calendar. Many of you are familiar with it. Anybody not familiar with the Hebrew calendar? Okay. Anybody an expert in the Hebrew calendar? Okay. Hebrew calendar is a lunar calendar. All right. God established the calendar as being lunar. This is why you have new moon festivals. Even Paul talked about that in Colossians. He said, don't criticize somebody for their Sabbath observance or their new moon observance. So the new moon was an important date. In the Hebrew, it's Rosh Kodesh. This was an important time in the calendar. First of all, seasons were set by the moon. Planting seasons. New month began with a new moon. And so you can't look at the sun and tell where you are in the month, can you? But you can take a look at the moon and tell you where you are in the cycle. And so the Hebrew calendar was 13 months long. And God established what the first month would be. And he established that in Exodus chapter 12. He said, this is to be the first month for you. So actually, the biblical new year happens at Passover. Okay, so the first day of the first month, ten days, nine days later, is the selection of the lambs. Passover is actually on the 14th day of the first month. When you say, well, what about this Jewish New Year that occurs sometime in September? Well, that's a civil New Year. You say, well, how can you have two New Years? That's just ridiculous. Well, we have all kinds of New Years, don't we? We have uh, January 1st is New Year's, right? Terry, you teach school, right? Okay. Does a school, teach, school New Year start in January? No. When does it start? August. August. So you have a, a New Year in August. Well, that's ridiculous. The New Year's in January. Okay. What about a fiscal year? Anybody work for a company? Greg, when is your fiscal year? We go on the calendar. You go on the calendar year. Lots of people do, but anybody have a fiscal year that ends in June? What's that? February. February. Okay. So you have a new, new business year. Well, that's ridiculous. The new year's on January 1st. No, we have all kinds of new years. All right? So when we look at the biblical calendar, we seem to equate it as, well, that's so confusing because you, there's only one new year. Well, that's not true. You've got a new school year, a new fiscal year. You have all kinds of celebrations. Matter of fact, there's a new year for trees. That happens to occur in February. Okay, there's uh, you know, all kinds of new years in the Bible. And so when we look at this, we have to understand not complexities, but we have to understand the calendar that was set at the beginning that Jesus observed. And he lived by that calendar. The people in the agricultural regions live by that calendar. So everything that, that is being discussed in the New Testament conforms to that calendar. You know, we ask a question, what's a day? Okay, a day to us is 24 hours, right? Okay, well, in the Bible, a day is still 24 hours. But the day doesn't begin at sunrise. The day begins at sundown. Okay, that's the beginning of a new day. All right. Now, what's interesting is, is that you say a day is 24 hours, but in the Bible, in the Jewish calendar, the way you count days is any day part is considered to be a full day. So if the day, let's say, uh, let's say 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. is the day, right? All right. And it's 5 o'clock in the afternoon. 
So five to six o'clock, you would say, well, that's one hour. But in the Bible, that's one day. I always wondered why they said Jesus was in the grave three days. Well, there you go. There you go. Okay. So in order to understand the counting of this all right, and understanding exactly what the day was, because people say it was Friday, right? Okay. Well, then we have to understand the Sabbaths. Because you would say, well, there's 52 weeks, that means 52 Fridays, so there must be 52 Sabbaths. Well, there are, and that's a great starting point. But anywhere in the Bible that it says, have a sacred assembly and do no regular work, that constitutes a Sabbath. And there's a minimum of 64 Sabbaths in the Bible. So in any given year, there's a minimum of 64 of them. Let me give you an example. If Passover was on a uh, Thursday, that would be a Sabbath. Friday would be a Sabbath, too. So that means preparation day would be Wednesday, where everybody assumes preparation day is Thursday because the Sabbath occurs on Friday. But if you don't understand the biblical calendar, you would think that every week has one Sabbath and that's the way it is. If Passover were to occur on a Wednesday, guess what? Wednesday is a Sabbath, Thursday, the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, is a Sabbath, and Friday is a Sabbath. So you could have three Sabbaths back to back in the same week. So now when we begin to look at the counting of the time of Jesus last week, we have to examine what Preparation Day was. Okay, preparation Day is always the day before the Sabbath. So if a Sabbath is occurring, excuse me, if the Sabbath is occurring on a Friday, or Thursday or Wednesday, the day before, is Preparation Day. Guess what? Israel observes two Passovers. It's the first Passover, second Passover. So could it be that the Passover that Jesus celebrated was on a Wednesday night? As the first Passover. Could it be? And we'll examine all that and we'll look at the timing. Because God gave very specific timing. He didn't call it Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. He called it the first day of the first month, the tenth day of the first month, the fourteenth day of the first month, the tenth day of the seventh month, the first, the fifteenth day of the seventh month. And so you have to look at it according to God's timeline, not man's interpretation. So you have to plot it out very carefully. And so our understanding of when these events occurred. Now, we may draw the conclusion that Jesus was crucified on a Thursday. Does that negate Good Friday? It does not. Good Friday is a uniform observance around the world to celebrate the crucifixion of Christ, right? Okay. Palm Sunday. Okay. And yes, on that day that he entered Jerusalem that year, it was a Sunday. But when we look at the other days of the week, we have to plot them out as according to the Bible, not according to man's calendar. And so is Easter always on Sunday? Well, Passover and Easter should be the same, right? <clears throat> no? Passover and uh, Good Friday should always be the same. Mm, why not? Because Constantine was the one that changed everything. 325 A.D., Constantine instituted a uniform standard that says Passover moves from month to month. This year, Passover is one month later than Easter. So Constantine said, we're not going to have this Jewish calendar stuff. We're going to go ahead and celebrate it all the same time, the same way every year. So that's what we do. Does that mean it's right? Does that mean it's wrong? It means that when two or more gather in his name, there he'll be in the midst of them. It doesn't really matter what day you observe it as long as you observe it. And striving for uniformity <clears throat> is not something that's so unusual because in the Jewish world, for 24 consecutive hours, the Sabbath is observed in every time zone. So if candle lighting time in Jerusalem, say sundown in Jerusalem, 6 o'clock, for every time zone, 6 o'clock, 6 o'clock, 6 o'clock, 6 o'clock, 24 hours, you have the Sabbath being observed uniformly around the world. That seems like a pretty good idea. Well, you do the same thing on Easter Sunday, all the way around the clock, all the way around the world. Every time zone, you've got 24 consecutive hours of worship on that Sunday. That sounds like a pretty good idea to me. Does that mean it's the biblical date? It does not. Does that mean that that's our date of observance because of tradition? It means that it does. 
Okay, does that mean it's good or bad? Listen, I wasn't there when somebody picked the name Easter. Were you? You know, was Jesus born on December 25th? Does it really matter? Okay, you don't celebrate Mother's Day on, everybody doesn't celebrate it differently on their mother's birthday or Father's Day or Veterans Day, right? As a matter of fact, we should be celebrating the life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus every day. What's it say on the communion table? As often as you do this, do this in remembrance of me. Give us this day our daily bread. So we should be doing it every day. Why do we need a specific date? Okay, because tradition dictates that we do things uniformly. And I think that's very pleasing to God. When you think about the fact that there's two and a half billion believers, that means there's four and a half billion non-believers. It's got to be pleasing to God when anybody calls on the, upon the name of the Lord. So we need to lighten up about tradition and lighten up about criticizing and lighten up about how we tag things and, you know, look at the message behind it. The Bible required the Jews to make three pilgrimages to Jerusalem. They're called the Shalosh Regalim, three required pilgrimages. Three times a year the Jews had to make pilgrimages to Jerusalem. And three times a year they had to bring a specific sacrifice. So Passover was a lamb. Right? There's a Feast of a Pentecost offering and there's a Feast of Tabernacles offering. And when you read the last nine chapters of Ezekiel, you find out that in the Millennial Kingdom those sacrifices will be reinstituted. Not according to the law of Moses, but the law of the fourth temple. Now what's interesting to note is the second temple in comparison to the first temple. Solomon's temple, you remember the big event when Solomon dedicated the temple and the Shekinah glory of God came into the temple, right? Well, <clears throat> we see Zerubbabel laid the foundation of the second temple. Herod expanded that. But where was the dedication and where was the event where the Shekinah glory of God came into the temple, the second temple? Well, I can tell you the day it happened. The day that Jesus entered the temple after he came up out of the water, that's when the Shekinah glory of God entered the temple. So it wasn't the same as the first temple. It wasn't the same as the first temple because Israel was under the law of Moses. And the law of Moses required that the priesthood, the high priest, be in the lineage of one specific person, Aaron. Well, guess what? Caiaphas was not a relative. Caiaphas was appointed. So sacrifices could be made, but it wasn't like it was in the first temple where the glory of God was there. Now you had sacrifices being made by someone that was not qualified under the governance of God. When we read the description of the millennial temple, we see that there's a specific reference to the priesthood, the sons of Zadok. Well, why would it be the sons of Zadok? Because Zadok was the last one in Aaron's lineage to serve as high priest in the line of Aaron. So when God reinstitutes it again in the millennial temple, the one that will be sanctioned by God, where the Shekinah glory will be there because Jesus will be there, then the priesthood will be reestablished as the sons of Zadok and will include Gentile priests for the first time in history. So it's a whole different system and a whole different setup. Israel was under Roman rule. Rome, Rome, Rome were the oppressors. You remember Cassius came in and uh, the temple was in disarray. Zerubbabel's temple had been kind of uh, neglected. And so Cassius comes in and he says, if you like your temple, you can keep your temple. So I'm going to rebuild your temple for you. Just like any politician would come in and do. But the people of Israel didn't trust him. And so they said, you show us all the materials first and then we'll believe you. So they assembled all the materials in Jerusalem and they began building and restoring what Zerubbabel had built and expanded upon it according to Herod's plans. And so when we think of the second temple, we refer to it as Herod's temple, but it was really Zerubbabel who started the process. Well, they were still oppressed by Rome. And Jesus spoke about this. They asked about paying taxes, and he said, Render under Caesar what belongs to Caesar. But the Jews were expecting to be delivered. They were expecting the prophecy of Zechariah 12 to come to pass, where God says, uh, Behold, the day is coming when I will make Jerusalem a cup that sends the world reeling, and when all the nations of the world come against Jerusalem, then I'll restore her to her former glory. And that was their expectation. That when the Messiah came, 
that he was going to bring Jerusalem back to when it was the spiritual capital of the world and drive Rome out. But that's not what happened. But in order for everything to happen according to Scripture, we have to go back to the statement that Jesus made in 2 Corinthians 5.17. He said, I did not come to abolish the law of the prophets. I came to fulfill them. And not until everything that must happen has happened, not the least stroke of the pen will disappear from the law. And anybody who breaks those laws and teaches others to do so will be considered least in the kingdom of heaven. <clears throat> but whoever keeps those laws and teaches others to do so will be considered great in the kingdom of heaven. It's quite a statement that he came to fulfill the law. Meaning every aspect of the law had to be fulfilled by him. There could be no exception. I'll give you an example. When he raised the girl from the, who was dead, it said he laid his hand upon her. Was she dead when he laid his hand upon her? Does that matter to you? It matters to me, because if he touched a dead body, he'd be unclean. So it must mean that by his spoken word, he resurrected her. And when he touched her, she was no longer dead. Otherwise, he would have broken the law. The rejection of Jesus took place by the Pharisees, by the Sanhedrin at a very specific time in the Bible. It was not the crucifixion. It was a year and a half before. And what took place was he was casting out a demon. And the leaders, the teachers came to him and said, you cast out demons in the name of Beelzebub. And his response was, a house divided against itself cannot stand. You can say whatever you want about me. But if you blaspheme the Holy Spirit, you cannot be forgiven. Now remember again, there's no New Testament. What had they done that he condemned that wicked generation would not see the kingdom of heaven? What had they done? 613 laws. You know 10 of them very, very well. What had they done? What command had they broken? The third commandment. The third commandment in the Hebrew reads, You shall not take the Lord's name in vain, or you shall not be found guiltless. See, the unpardonable sin had been established by God on Mount Sinai. He had already established that, the third commandment. And so what were they breaking? They weren't breaking some new design that he gave them. He was referring to something that they knew specifically, that they had blasphemed the Holy Spirit. This was the unpardonable sin. It was already in the Ten Commandments. So that was a year and a half before his crucifixion, meaning they spent a year and a half plotting his demise, enlisting people and sending people out to trip him, to test him, to come against him. And it's important that we understand that because there was a group of people, the leadership, that rejected him. This is why when we take a look at Palm Sunday, we remember he enters Jerusalem and the people cry out something very specific. They say, save us, O King, Hosanna. Save us, O King, Son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Well, that's quite a statement because about 12 hours later, as he's leaving town, he turns around and he looks at Jerusalem and he says, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who stoned the prophets and rejected the ones sent to you. Like a mother hen longs to gather her chicks, how I long to gather you back to me, but you were not willing. Look, your house remains desolate. Jerusalem, you will not see me again until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Wasn't well, that kind of odd to you? They just said it that morning. The people of Jerusalem said it to him, so he must not have been talking to them. He must not have been talking to the people that were getting saved on the streets that recognized him and cried out for him. He was referring to the people that had rejected him a year and a half before. And that's the expectation that we have today, that Israel will gather together. We know the events that will take place in the campaign of Armageddon to bring them to that desolate place of Basra, of Petra, where they'll be surrounded by the Antichrist, armies of the Antichrist, and they will cry out and repent of their sin, which was the national sin of Israel, the rejection of Jesus. But it wasn't the people on the street that rejected Jesus, it was the leadership. It reminds us all the time that so goes the head, so goes the body. That God judges the head of a nation, and the people underneath suffer for the actions of the king. And so you look all through the Old Testament as you read Kings and Chronicles, and you see which were the good kings, which there weren't that many, who tore down the Asherah poles and the altars and the high places, and the people were blessed. 
But when there was a wicked king, the people suffered. They were overthrown by other governments. Their temple was defiled by Gentile kings and ultimately by Jewish kings. And so when we look at that situation, we're in that same situation. We're no different than the time of Saul when the people cried out for a king because God gave them a king based on the condition of their heart. You take a look at the heart of America, the heart of the nation, it's no surprise that Barack Obama got elected. Based on the wickedness of our country, so progressive, so left-leaning, leaning that the ship is on its side. Abortion, same-sex marriage, no prayer in school, um, minority rules, majority drools. I mean, they have absolutely no regard for the will of the people, none whatsoever. And so when we look at that, we've been given a king who looks just like the heart, the wicked hearts of the people. It's no, re- no surprise that he's selling us out to Islam. So when Jesus journeyed for the last time to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover, he was ready to complete his work on earth. For, th- for three years he had taught the people, preaching the gospel of the kingdom and, de- and demonstrating with signs and wonders that he was the Messiah, the anointed one, promised by the Old Testament prophets. Now he would suffer die, then triumph over death by rising on the third day. Jesus had previously resisted attempts to be made king. When you read John 6.15, Jesus, knowing that they intended to come and make him king by force, withdrew again to a mountain by himself. He had cautioned his disciples to tell no man he was the Christ, the Messiah, or tell the vision of the transfiguration of Matthew 16.20. Then he ordered his disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. Well, it's kind of interesting, the Mount of Transfiguration. We go by there, where we believe it is when we go to Israel. And what took place on that mountain? There was Jesus in the middle, surrounded by two people. Moses and Elijah, right? Why? Why them? Why two? Well, first of all, under Levitical law, the testimony of two or more witness is required for something to be established. But why those two witnesses? Moses was the first to prophesy that a Messiah was to come. He was the first one to say, one will come after me like me. You are to follow him and do whatever he tells you. Otherwise, you'll be cut off from your people. Now, you remember I started this out by saying the minds of the people of Israel were focused on Scripture. They all knew the teachings of Moses. This was passed down from generation to generation. You grew up in not a Jewish culture, but Jewish life. So we take a man like Peter, and Jesus walks up to Peter and he says two words. What two words did he say? Follow me. Why did he say follow me and why did Peter follow him? Because he remembered the words of Moses. One will come after me like me to follow him. What other prophet ever said to anybody, follow me? Not a single prophet in the Bible. He went to Matthew, a man named Levi, a Jewish man tax collector. And he wasn't just a tax collector sitting at a table stacking money. He was the franchise owner. He owned all the gates, all the tables at all the gates collecting all the money. He had already bid to Rome and guaranteed them their take. And anything over that he got to keep. And Jesus walks up to him and he says, what two words? Follow me. And Matthew gets up from his table and he walks away. Why would he do that if he didn't know the words of Moses? This was a declaration by Jesus that I'm the one Moses told you about. Follow me. So when we have the mind of the Bible, we look at situations, we hear words differently than we do if we don't have a mind of the Word of God. We hear things and we process them in the local timeline. Well, they were no different. They processed things in the local frame of mind. The local frame of mind was the mind of Isaiah, the mind of Ezekiel, the mind of Daniel, the mind of Moses. If you're there every single day living in a world where sacrifices are made, there's local synagogues, we go to the city of Dan, and we go there and we see the layout, and you walk up and you see how it was guarded, and you come up the hill and you walk and you see where the city was, and then you see the high place. And isn't that interesting that even in this small chapel, there's still a high place. In every church, you probably find a high place. 
Every synagogue you find the high place. In every city you found the high place. The high place was where the altar was, the closest point to God. This is why pastors stand up there and preach. Letting you know they're closer to God and they're bringing you a message down from God to distribute to the people. Well, why Elijah? Because the prophecy was that Elijah would come before the day of the Lord. And so we see that those two witnesses are very specific witnesses that were recognized by the disciples. Do we recognize them as the ones that fulfill the prophecies, the ones that confirm that he is the one? He's there in the middle of the two. But doesn't that take us back, hearken us back to Genesis where Abraham is sitting in the opening of his tent? And we actually go to that place in Genesis land. And he's sitting there with his t- in, in the, in, at noon, in the heat of the day, and he sees approaching him, what? The angel of the Lord surrounded by two angels. The angel of the Lord is always a reference to the pre-incarnate Jesus. So here you have Jesus. Okay? Now, two people that are gone, Moses and Elijah. And by the way, where was the Mount of Transfiguration? What country was that in? Israel. Israel's the promised land, right? So I guess Moses made it after all. (laughs) Right? Okay. When you think about it, for us, we may not be in the promised land, but when we die and we go to heaven, that's the promised land for us. And so we understand this. Now the time had come for Jesus to manifest himself as the Messiah, the King, in fulfillment of prophecy, Zechariah 9, 9. He rode to the city of Jerusalem upon the colt of an ass in a lowly and meek manner. (coughs) Excuse me. This is the only reference in the scripture that Jesus rode. As he proceeded toward the city, the people shouted, Hosanna, recognizing and acclaiming the arrival of the kingdom of David, salvation, peace, and joy. Kings don't ride horses. A horse is a sign of battle. So the king doesn't go into battle. And so we see that. Now the population of Jerusalem at the time of Jesus was about 600,000. And we can figure this out by counting the number of lambs slain at that Passover, which was 256,500 lambs. Think that's a lot of lambs? It's a lot of lambs. So they multiplied that number by 10, the average number of persons served by each lamb. At the lowest computation of 10 people per lamb, this would give a population of 2.565 million. Or as Josephus himself put it uh, in Jewish Wars, chapters 6, 9, and 3, uh, 2,700,200 people. So who were these people that were gathered into Jerusalem? Jewish people were fishermen, farmers, shepherds with herds and flocks, or rabbis, teachers, teachers of the law. Were they illiterate? See, everybody talks about Peter being illiterate. That's not what the scripture says. He was unschooled, meaning that he wasn't the chosen son of the family to go or chosen by a rabbi, but he finally was chosen by a rabbi. You see, the way the system worked was the rabbi chose his disciples. You couldn't say, oh, I want to sit under Rabbi Eric. Rabbi Eric would have to go to you and say, follow me, come with me. And we see that pattern. So why would he pick somebody who was illiterate? Because he represented a faction of the city, the common man, the fisherman. Let's take a look at the fishermen. I guess when we think of fishermen, we think of what? Like the deadliest catch. Bunch of guys drinking, no teeth, tattoos, bar fights, right? Except for the fact, you remember I mentioned that that corridor that comes down from Iran down through Israel and down into Egypt is a, is a trade route. And people have to buy supplies along that route. So not only would he catch fish and had people working for him that he had to pay, he had to maintain boats, purchase boats or manufacture boats. He had to make nets or purchase nets, repair nets. He also had to speak several languages in order to trade with visitors coming through the region, plus his regular customers. He also had to be able to exchange money. 
How illiterate can you be when you're an enterprising entrepreneur 2,000 years ago? Plus, you were taxed. And you had to give an account for the tax. So he had to be able to keep records. So how illiterate was he? And why do we have this perception of this illiterate group of people? Because they weren't that illiterate. They were schooled in the areas of their trade. Same way we know that Jesus' father was a, call him a carpenter, but there's not a lot of wood structures in the desert. Not a lot of wood in the desert. A lot of stone in the desert. So a carpenter being a builder, okay, was he building with what material? We seem to think a carpenter is somebody that builds with wood. All right, but if you remember the building of the temple, they had to bring wood in, the cedars of Lebanon. They had to bring the wood in. They had to import it. So probably in stonework. But Jesus was trained in the trade. As did generation after generation. But if you were in the line of Aaron, the same way John the Baptist was, who wasn't a Baptist at all, he was the son of a Levitical priest, Zechariah. And you remember that Zechariah was the one who was part of the 24 divisions of 1,000 priests that drew lots to be able to work in the Holy of Holies, in the temple, in the, in, at the altar of incense, right? So why would his son be a Baptist? His son was a Jew, right? So when we think about it, we have to change our, our mindset back 2,000 years. We've got to put it back in perspective. As a matter of fact, technically, John was the last Old Testament prophet. Doesn't mean that he's in the Old Testament, but when you think about what is the Old Testament, the Old Testament would be anything prior to the death of Jesus, right? That would be the Old Testament. So he was the last Old Testament prophet. And what he said was very profound. Jews made the three pilgrimages, Passover, Pentecost, and the Feast of Tabernacles. This was required. This wasn't optional. And I mentioned tailgating. Imagine that you had three trips and you had a group of people you went with all that time from your community. You would travel together. You'd make plans together. Right? Your kids would ride together. They would do things together. So it wasn't unusual when we look at that circumstance of Jesus being left behind because he could be in your wagon. He could be in your group. Okay? It was not unusual. So it wasn't like they should call the Department of Children and Family Services to, on Joseph and Mary because they were neglectful parents. It's a whole different environment, a whole different world. Children were schooled in the Tanakh, the Old Testament. Maybe not every chapter and verse, maybe not all of the writings of the Kings and Chronicles, and, but certainly in the prophecies and certainly in the law because you lived in that life. And remember, you, the Catholic Church is kind of similar in a way to the old world Jewish world where you had daily sacrifices. So you went to the synagogue daily. People go into the church and light candles on a daily basis. It's part of their for the devout ones. Okay? Well, it's really no different. You know, many of the traditions of Catholicism are taken from Jewish life. You know, the more that they intend not to be Jewish, the more Jewish like they get. But they were hopeful of a coming Messiah. And the environment they lived in was the hope that Moshiach, in the Hebrew, Moshiach, Messiah, would come. And they had certain expectations. They knew of the prophecies, certainly the major prophecies. They knew of what Moses said. They knew about what Daniel said about timelines because the timelines of Daniel are very specific and they were looking at those timelines, understanding. They understood the weeks and they understood the timing. But they also had specific expectations. And how do we know that? Well, we know four in particular that they had were very specific. One was the dead were raised after four days, blind men given sight, leprosy healed, Deliverance of a dumb spirit, uh, deaf hearing, uh, poor hearing the good news. How do we know this and what does that really mean? Well, the dead being raised after four days. Now, understanding the pharisaical mind, the Pharisees believed that the soul left the body after three days. Therefore, could not be resurrected. Now, we know today about rigor mortis, that the, that the uh, organs aren't viable that they're broken down, that there's no possibility of resurrection after three days. But why four days? Because four days was beyond any human intervention because the soul had left the body. 
Well, the only way you could resurrect somebody dead for four days was to give them a new soul. Who can give them a new soul? Only God. So now we look at the story of Lazarus. We say, couldn't have Jesus gotten there sooner? Yes, he could have gotten there sooner. As a matter of fact, the statement was made, if you had only gotten here sooner, he'd be alive. As if he had made a mistake in his calculation of the time. But now Lazarus had been dead for four days. And did he go in and talk to him or lay hands on him? No. He stood outside and said three words. Lazarus, come forth. Only an act of God. Remember, in that environment, they understood perfectly what happened. Well, the blind man given sight. Listen, I've had healing services, all kinds of healing services. We've had all kinds of wonderful things happen, people getting hearing back and all that, but I'm no Messiah. I serve one, but I'm no Messiah. But what's the big deal about a blind man being given sight? We read about miracle reports all over the world. If you watch Sid Roth at all, it's supernatural. You'll hear all kinds of reports about supernatural healings and events taking place, limbs growing back. But what was so profound about that? What was profound is the statement blind from birth, meaning he had no eyes. Birth defect. So how did Jesus heal him? He's at the pool of Salaam. He reaches down into the dirt, spits in it, and puts it on his his eye. And what does he do? He creates an eye. Now, man can't do that. Man can recreate. He can procreate. There's an old story that goes that... uh, A scientist yells out to God, see, I did it. I created life in this test tube. I took this element and that element and that element, and I put them together, and I created life. And God speaks and says, go get your own elements. (laughs) Go get your own elements. So man can't create. And we look at the first words of the Bible, Bereshit bara Elohim. In the beginning, God created only God can bara, B-A-R-A. We'll go to the Pool of Salaam when we're in Israel. We'll stand at the very location, not the place, but the location of the Pool of Salaam. We'll go there and we'll see. And we'll read this story from the Bible. And you can see the environment as people are gathered. The paralytics were there. The, the sick were there because this was a healing pool. And he came and he reached down. Why did he do? Why did he reach down? Because he was fulfilling the words he said, I only do what I saw my father do. I only say what I heard my father say. The word Elohim in the first line of the Bible is a plural. It's not singular. It means one, but it's a compound one. It's a plural one. Like a bunch of grapes or a family or a corporation, one corporation, many parts. So who was there with God when he created the heavens and the earth? Who was there with God on the sixth day when he reached down into the dirt and from the dust of the earth created man? Jesus. I only do what I saw my father do. And so now you see this being fulfilled in this particular act. Only God can create a body part. Leprosy healed. You know, leprosy was a, was a sin. It was an affliction of God. It was given to those that were in sin. We remember Miriam got leprosy because she railed against Moses. Right? Kicked out of the camp for seven days. Right? One of the miracles that Moses was supposed to perform for Pharaoh was to put his hand into his cloak, pull it out and have it leprous, leprous and put his hand in the cloak and pull it out. Aaron performed that for Israel, but Moses never performed that for Egypt. Because God is the author and the healer of leprosy. Because it represents the forgiveness of sins, and only God can forgive sins. Do you remember when they lowered the paralytic down? And he said, your sins are forgiven. And there was an uproar. How can you do that? That's blasphemy. Only God can forgive. He said, what, is it easier for me to say, take your mat, get up and walk? Well, okay, I'll play to the audience. Hey, take your mat, get up and walk. And the guy took his mat and got up and walked. The forgiveness of sin is an attribute of God, not an attribute of man. 
And the fourth one is kind of a fascinating one, the deliverance of a dumb spirit. <clears throat> now, in the beginning, <clears throat> excuse me, in the beginning, in the Garden of Eden, <clears throat> God brought everything to Adam to name. And everything that he named, he gave him authority over. You remember that? He brought the animals one by one to him, and Adam named them, and he gave him a dominion and authority over that. He even brought his wife to him. And he gave her a name, and he had dominion and authority over her. The only one thing that God did not bring him to name was what? Himself. So God has dominion over that which has no name. Man only has dominion over that which has a name. Let's look at that practically. Dr. Brinley, can you, can you uh, treat me if you don't have a diagnosis? You can treat me without a diagnosis? Empirically. Empirically you can, but naturally, if you don't, you know, I have a toothache, okay? You're going to examine it, right? You're going to diagnose it. Oh, you have an abscess, okay? I have an infection. Here's how we deal with infection. You've got to name it first, don't you? You've got to put a name to it, okay? In order for you as a doctor to have authority over it, you've got to put a name to it. You've got to have a diagnosis in order to have treatment, okay? How do you treat something with no name? You go through the process, we're going to rule out until we come to something with a name, and then we have a definitive path, right? So, here's a man with, who's possessed. And he's possessed by a dumb spirit, meaning the spirit cannot tell you its name. So we've seen this before in the Bible. We see <clears throat> Jesus came to a man and said to the demon, what is your name? And he said, uh, our name is Legion, for we, for we are many. And he has a conversation with him. The disciples see this and hear this and they understand how to cast out demons. You get a name and you cast out the demon, but they bring a man to them that can't tell them its name. And they have no dominion over that which has no name. But Jesus was able to deliver the man of a dumb spirit. Why? Because that's an attribute of God. God has dominion over that which has no name. Man has dominion over that which has a name. So, how do we know this is the case? Because... We read about this in Matthew 11:2. 2. Now, when John heard in prison about the deeds Jesus had done, he sent his disciple to ask a question. Are you the one who is to come, or should we look for another? And think now about this answer, because this answer was not random. It wasn't just a news report. It was itemized, item by item, what the expectation of the Pharisees were. He says, you go tell John what you hear, what you've heard about, and what you've seen, what you've borne witness to. The blind see, the lame walk, leopards are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the poor have good news proclaimed to them. Blessed is anyone who takes no offense at me. It's a very specific answer. Taylor made to send this message back to inform the leadership of Israel, I am the Son of God. And when we look at this, this is written in the Gospel to the Jews. Matthew is the gospel for the Jews. More references to the Old Testament and the gospel of Matthew than all three other gospels combined. This is the gospel to the Jews. And this is where this is referenced. Now, last <clears throat> for tonight will be this. This is what first century Jerusalem looked like. You see the temple down at the bottom. You see the hippodrome over there in the middle. And then you see these open fields. Why open fields? Because that's where you put all the people that make pilgrimage three times a year. So the community of Israel, the regular living quarters, day-to-day -day activity was all over there. And this is where you have the corrals and you have all the people to gather. This is the campgrounds. Now when you take a look at the description of the fourth temple, the millennial temple, in the last nine chapters of Ezekiel, you see that this temple which was only a couple hundred by a couple hundred, is now one mile square. The Temple Mount is 50 miles square. It's on the side of a mountain where the mountain side is 20 by 50 miles on the south side and 20 by 50 miles on the north side. That's a huge mountain, much bigger than the Temple Mount, which wasn't a mountain at all, it's just really a hill. And when you go there and see it, you're going to be unimpressed at the height, even at the time 2,000 years ago, you'll be unimpressed at the height of this hill of Mount Moriah. 
not a mountain at all. It's a hill. We have bigger mountains here. And I come from Pennsylvania. We've got big, big mountains. But we have to understand the context in order to understand the prophecies and what life was like. And as we examine what began on that Palm Sunday, when we get back together next week, we're going to walk through those last four days of what happened, why it happened, to give you a deeper understanding of all that. All right, questions? Comments? Throw money. Yes, sir. I thought Adam only named Eve after the fall. Before the fall, after the fall, the timing of it, he had dominion over her. Not really. You're thinking that Genesis 1 and Genesis 2 are two different events? Two different stories, two different creations? No. No, because they're the, they're the I same. Mean, timing is important, right? Well, but nevertheless, the dominion was established over that which, which was given a name. So he had dominion over Eve. He was responsible for her actions. <clears throat> That's why he was the one that committed the sin by not intervening. She was tempted, but he did nothing about it. He participated in it. So we lost that dominion. It's been given back to us, Luke 10, 19. Luke 10, 19 says, I've given you the authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and overcome all the power of the enemy. Nothing whatsoever shall harm you. So when you become a believer in Jesus, <clears throat> your dominion is restored. This is why you have dominion over the demonic. It's why you have dominion over illness and disease. And you can be demonically oppressed, but not demonically possessed. It's a whole nother teaching. You know, I thought a man or a woman is a name. Man or a woman is a name? Yeah, if you call her a woman, that's a man name. Is that what you call Joanne? <laughs> I call her. I call her. <laughs> <laughs> right. right. Somehow I knew that, Ken. Somehow I knew that. <clears throat> Somehow I knew that. I think Archie Bunker said that a lot too. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes. Agricultural type environment. Did they hire people to take care of their flocks and stuff while they were gone that were non Jewish people? I've always wondered what happened to the community when they left because some of the journeys were quite a ways away. That's exactly right. Yes, absolutely. Remember, the Exodus was mixed, mixed multitude. So the communities of Israel were mixed multitude. So you had, and still to this day, listen, the, the uh, uh, not my favorite expression, but, but uh, growing up, my grandparents had what was called a Shabbos Goy. It was a Gentile person that came in and cooked and cleaned and took care of the family from the Sabbath so that they didn't have to do any work in the home to break the Sabbath laws. They hired a Gentile to do it. As a matter of fact, tradition in Israel is that instead of giving the land a sabbatical year, which they're supposed to do, what they do is they lease the land to a Gentile so that they're absolved from it. And they can say, I didn't work the land, I gave the land a rest, but these guys worked it. Okay? So it's all that pharisaical technical stuff that's the workaround. But yes, they had, and you remember, there were also indentured, you know, bond servants, right, that had to work for the family for a period of time. So did everybody go? Was it required? Yes. Did everybody go? I can't answer that question whether or not every community emptied itself. Uh, but every community was not just, it wasn't the ghettos like we had uh, where all the Jewish people were herded together. You lived in communities, so the Galileans uh, weren't all Jewish. You know, you had all kinds of people. Remember, you had the Arabs that the, the lived uh, in the land, Okay, working in the land, Bedouins were there, uh, you know, and we saw the communities that Moses had to go around, the Edomites, uh, to get into the promised land. So there were still other people there. There were people that they hadn't yet conquered yet. You had the Moabites, you had um, the, uh, the uh, termites, the parasites. <laughs> <clears throat> Correct. 
Correct, because remember you had uh, like Sarah had Hagar, and so you acquired men servants and maid servants, and they were from many of them were from Egypt. Other questions? Go on once, go on twice. All right, let me send you out of here with a blessing. Don't forget, please put something in the bag. If you got a free meal and you enjoyed it, tip your waiter. All right. All right, stand to your feet. Let me send you out with a blessing, and uh, I'll get together with the Brindleys and the uh, Herndons about their Israel trip. Uh, in Numbers chapter 6 and verse 22, the Lord said to Moses, Tell Aaron and his sons, this is how you are to bless the children of Israel. He goes on to say, In this way, I will put my name on them and I will bless them. Please bow your heads to receive the Aaronic benediction. Yibarecha Adonai v'yasmerecha, Ya'er Adonai panavaleka v'ikonecha, Yisar Adonai panavaleka v'yasimlecha shalom. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his countenance toward you and give you his peace. In the name of the Prince of Peace, Jesus our Messiah. Amen and amen. You are dismissed. Behind the scenes of the Middle East conflict rages a biblical battle as old as time. Two seemingly innocent teenagers cross paths and a mystery begins to unfold. Jake Aronson, Jewish son of a U.S. diplomat, has unusual ties to the intelligence community and has savant gifting in solving puzzles, codes, and ciphers. Jake meets Hakeem Baba, a Tehran-born radical Muslim bent on the destruction of the Jewish people and whose father is a Turkish diplomat to the United States. The two of them forge a friendship while in boarding school. But during his visits with the Aronson family, Hakeem learns of DNA testing to determine Jewish lineage. He also learns of a secret the family has kept for over 3,000 years. Now, Hakeem's plans have been discovered. Jake and his team deploy to stop him. Their final encounter brings about a chilling transformation and opens the door to the next installment of The Aaron Chronicles, revealing the mystery behind Aaron's robe. The Codist, The Aaron Chronicles by Eric E. Walker from Tate Publishing. Signed copies available at thecodistbook.com.